ಜ್ಞಾನಾಂಜನಶಲಾಕಯಾ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮೀಲ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪಾದಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪ್ರೇಷ್ಠಾ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿವೇದಾಂತಸ್ವಾಮಿನ್ಯತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತೆ ದೇವೆ ಗೌರವಾಣೀ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದೀ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶತಾರಿಣೆ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಮೋರ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಫೈಸ್ so far we have been discussing what is the soul from the bhagavad gita now something about sacrifice from the bhagavad gita in the third chapter krishna says while describing what is karma yoga yagnyarthat karmano anyatra lokoyam karma bandhanah tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sanga samachara this means work done as sacrifice for vishnu has to be performed otherwise work binds one to this material world therefore perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction and in that way you will always remain unattached and free from bondage so krishna is describing how we can do work such a way that we don't get bound up in this world any activity normally people do depending on whether that activity is a pious activity or a sinful activity there are reactions pious activities means good reactions and sinful activities means bad reactions pious activity means some enjoyment and in the future and sinful activity means suffering in the future so as opposed to these two kinds of activities pious or sinful there is a third kind of activity that krishna is describing here as yagna yagna or sacrifice for vishnu yagna means sacrifice for vishnu so if work is done as sacrifice for vishnu then there is no bondage there is no reaction there is no uh, bondage therefore krishna is advising instructing arjuna do your prescribed duties as sacrifice to vishnu for vishnu satisfaction and in that way you will completely be unattached you might have heard many times people say we should do our duty but without attachment to result how is this possible it is only possible if we perform work as sacrifice so what is the significance of sacrifice to vishnu that krishna describes in the next verse this is the uh 10th verse in the third chapter of the bhagavad gita sahayagnya praja srishtva purovacha prajapati anena prasavishyadvam eshavot vishta kamadhuk it means in the beginning of creation the supreme lord vishnu who is the lord of all creatures he actually created generations of men and demigods along with sacrifices for vishnu and bless them by saying be thou happy by this yagna or sacrifice because its performance will bestow upon you all desirable things so whatever the human society requires all our necessities are supplied if we perform sacrifice that's the way this world is created then further krishna says in the 11th verse of the third chapter 
देवान भावयतानेन ते देवा भावयंतु वह परस्परम भावयंत श्रेय परम अवाप्स्य था दिस मीन्स द देवतास और द डेमी गॉड्स बींग प्लीज बाय सैक्रिफाइजेस विल ऑल्सो प्लीज यू यू मीन्स द ह्यूमन बींग्स दस नरिशिंग वन अनदर दे विल देर विल बी प्रॉस्पेरिटी फॉर ऑल बट कृष्ण सेस इष्टान भोगान हि वो देवा दास्यंते यज्ञ भाविता तैर्दत्तान अप्रदायेभ्यो यो भुंक्ते स्तेन एव सह नाउ द देवतास बीइंग सैटिस्फाइड बाय द परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ यज्ञ दे सप्लाई ऑल नेसेसिटीज बट एनीबॉडी हु एंजॉयज दीस गिफ्ट्स दीस सप्लाइज बाय द देवतास विदाउट ऑफरिंग देम टू द देवतास इन रिटर्न is certainly a thief so shrila prabhupada explains what does this mean the devatas are supplying agents on behalf of the supreme lord vishnu therefore one should perform the prescribed sacrifices or duties mentioned in the vedas and through the devatas actually all these sacrifices ultimately are meant for pleasing vishnu pleasing the supreme lord now if somebody does not do sacrifice but takes whatever is given by the devatas then such a person actually is considered to be a thief stena stena eva saha so just like a thief is punishable by state laws similarly somebody who takes all the supplies by the devatas and does not actually offer in return through sacrifice to the supreme lord or through uh, sacrifice to the devatas such a person will be punishable so in the uh, vedic system every householder has to do five kinds of sacrifice the five kinds of sacrifice are described as adhyapanam tarpanam Homa, Bali, and Atiti Pujanam. We are obliged, or we are obligated, to five different uh, pers- categories of personalities. When the moment we take birth as a human being, we have got some obligation to the demigods or devatas. So, by offering oblations with ghee, devatas are satisfied. by studying the vedas we are satisfying the great sages who give us all knowledge the devatas are supplying us with air and sunshine and moonshine and fire all the devatas different devatas supplying different necessities in that way the sages are giving us all the knowledge that we are receiving and the forefathers we receive something from our ancestor or forefathers so by offering uh water uh, tarpana called tarpana one is able to satisfy one's forefathers and this is called pitri yagna deva yagna rishi yagna pitri yagna and by performing bhuta yagna whatever benefits we take from general living beings other than humans just like uh we are dependent upon the bee for honey we are dependent on the cow for milk we are dependent on some agents which turn milk into curds some bacteria like they say lac some lactic bacteria lactose bacteria whatever that is so like that we are dependent on so many other beings for our needs so therefore we have to perform what is called as bhuta yagna and by properly receiving guests atithi poojanam one is able to perform nri yagna just like we are obligated in the society towards so many different categories of other human beings we are living in a society just like everyone doesn't stitch their own cloth we are dependent on a tailor for stitching the cloth we are dependent upon a weaver for getting our supply of cloth 
or we are dependent on a farmer who grows cotton for getting the cotton itself for producing the cloth and the cloth is uh, stitched according to our requirement by a tailor so each one doesn't do growing cotton weaving the cotton into yarn or uh, sorry uh, producing yarn out of cotton and then weaving that yarn into a cloth and then stitching the cloth like this you can understand we have so many different dependencies upon different other human beings in society so uh, we perform what is called as nriyagya and in that way we are able to uh, clear our debt towards all these personalities so uh, the example is given in the shrimad bhagavatam how krishna when he came 5000 years back when he incarnated he was ruling in dwaraka as the king so he was performing all these five kinds of yajnas every day now krishna has no need to perform these yajnas because he is a supreme lord but to teach us by his own example as an ideal householder as a kshatriya and as a grihastha there is something called varnashrama dharma varnashrama dharma means there are rules and regulations for a civilized human being according to the varna one belongs according to the occupational uh, classification uh, brahmana kshatriya vaishya shudra there are four different kinds of occupations for different categories of persons or people so krishna actually was ruling as the king therefore he belongs to the kshatriya class uh, and he was a grihastha there are four ashrama divisions brahmachari grihastha vanaprastha sanyas so krishna was a grihastha so as a kshatriya and as a grihastha krishna used to perform these five types of yajna that is described in the bhagavatam in the 10th canto by shukadeva goswami when shukadeva goswami is describing krishna's pastimes to parichit maharaj he describes how krishna as an ideal householder he used to perform these five types of sacrifices so the description is given that uh, lord krishna he would uh, perform these uh, activities daily activities so that these activities which are ideal uh, uh, duties of a householder should be followed by the general people but we should remember we cannot imitate krishna in all his activities just like krishna married 16108 princesses and therefore he had 16108 queens so it's not possible for anybody to imitate this act of krishna but we can definitely follow krishna's activities in terms of his doing his daily duties so uh, krishna used to lie down with the 16108 queens how would he do that he would he would expand himself into 16108 forms that's possible only for krishna because he is a supreme lord he is yogeshwara he is a master of all mystic powers so by his mystic power he would expand into as many forms he can expand into unlimited forms so he would expand and he would uh, actually enter each of the palaces of each of his queens and then he would rise early in the morning 3 hours before sunrise this time is called brahma muhurta 3 hours before sunrise so he would rise early in the morning and by nature's arrangement shrila prabhupad says that the crowing of the cocks is the indication of brahma muhurta beginning of brahma muhurta so shila prabhupada says there's no need of alarm clock as soon as the cocks crow in the morning one should get up and actually uh, begin the morning duties so what would krishna do as soon as he would rise from bed 3 hours before sunrise he would wash his mouth hands and feet and would immediately sit down and meditate on himself 
Now this does not mean that we have to get up in the morning and after cleansing ourselves we should meditate on ourselves. No. We should meditate on Krishna or we should meditate on Radha Krishna. That is Krishna is meditating on himself because he is the supreme. So he is teaching us that we should meditate on the supreme. That is real meditation. So there is no difference between meditating on Radha Krishna and chanting Hare Krishna. So the recommended form of meditation on Radha Krishna in this age is to chant Hare Krishna. Hare refers to Radharani and Krishna refers to Krishna. So if you chant Hare Krishna that is same as meditation on Radha Krishna. Then by such meditation it is described Krishna would feel very much satisfied. Similarly, we will also be satisfied and happy if we chant Hare Krishna early in the morning after rising at the time of Brahma Muhurt. Then after his meditation Krishna would perform his regular bath and then with clear sanctified water he would take his bath and then he would change into fresh clothing and he would do his daily religious duties. Out of his many religious duties, the first one was to offer oblations into the sacrificial fire. This is the first kind of yajna, deva yajna, deva yajna. So he would then chant the Gayatri mantra. This is uh, one of the duties of those who are belonging to the category called dvija, twice born. The Brahmanas, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas, they undergo this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, purificatory ceremony. It's called Samskara. Hmm? The Samskara of Upanayana, by which they actually receive the Gayatri Mantra from the spiritual master and every day chant the Gayatri Mantra. This is for making spiritual advancement so that we can actually understand the supreme absolute truth as transcendental to this material uh, creation. So it's for realizing the supreme. So therefore he would do uh, Gayatri, one is supposed to do Gayatri mantra, Japa, Krishna would do that. And then he would actually uh, offer specific prayers to the sun god. Now Krishna is the Supreme Lord, he has no need to do all this, but he is doing it as an ideal householder. What an ideal householder should do, he is teaching by his personal example. So the sun god and the other devatas mentioned in the Vedic scriptures are different limbs of the body of the Supreme Lord. And it is the duty of the householder to offer respects to the devatas and great sages as well as the forefathers. So Krishna would actually uh, worship the devatas beginning with the uh, sun god and he would then uh, offer tarpana uh, uh, to the forefathers and then he would actually uh, offer different sacrifices for the different uh, personalities and then in this way Krishna would complete all the five kinds of sacrifices. His next duty was to give cows in charity to the Brahmanas, a Kshatriya especially and Vaishya. They should give charity every day. So Krishna would give cows in charity to the Brahmanas. Dana, Godana. And how many cows would Krishna give? That is described in the Bhagavatam. He would give 107 groups of 13,084 cows. This is described specifically in the Bhagavatam. So he would give totally 14 lakh cows every day in charity to the Brahmanas. And the cows are described, they were decorated with a silken cloth and they would be decorated with a pearl necklace. Their horns were covered with gold and their hooves were covered with silver. All of them were full of milk due to having their first born calves with them and they were very very peaceful. 
And when the cows were given in, such cows were given in charity to the brahmanas, the brahmanas were also given nice silken garments and each was given a deer skin and sufficient quantity of sesame seeds. Completely, perfectly, Krishna would actually carry out his duty of giving uh, charity, cows and charity to the brahmanas. Because Krishna is known as Go Brahmana Hitayacha, Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmana Hitayacha, Jagaditaya Krishnaya, Govindaya Namo Namaha. So he is especially interested in the welfare of the cows and the brahmanas. Because protecting the cows and protecting the brahmanas means that is the way of actually. Uh, maintaining the Vedic culture. So Vedic culture is meant for spiritual advancement of the entire society. So therefore Krishna used to set an example. Krishna has set the example by himself giving cows in charity. Then wishing the welfare of all, uh, Krishna would actually touch auspicious articles like milk, honey, ghee, gold, jewels, fire. Although the Supreme Lord is very beautiful by nature, still he would dress himself in nice garments and he would wear nice flower garlands, he would wear his necklace of Kaustubha jewels, he would smear his body with pulp of sandalwood and decorate himself with other ornaments. But it is described, we should always remember, that Krishna was not beautified by the ornaments he would wear, rather the ornaments themselves became beautiful upon being placed on the transcendental form of Lord Krishna. So Krishna is not getting beautified by the ornaments. It is the ornaments which become beautified by being placed on Krishna's form. So there is a difference. Whenever a human being or anybody of this world, they wear an ornament that enhances their beauty. But when Krishna wears an ornament, it is for the ornament to become beautified. Then Krishna would actually uh, give darshan to those who would come to see him in the morning. So many brahmanas would come to have darshan of Krishna those who were living in Dwarka and they were anxious to see him so he welcomed them. His next duty was to please all kinds of people belonging to different categories, all the Varnas. So uh, within the city and within the palace compound whoever came to have Darshan of Krishna, he made them happy by fulfilling their different desires. And when the Lord saw everyone was happy, he himself was very much pleased. So this is a uh, spiritual life. Spiritual life means everyone, all the devotees, they try to please Krishna. And Krishna tries to please the devotees. This way, each one trying to please the other, they become happy. This is actually the... Uh, our real position that we are meant to please Krishna and Krishna is meant to uh, Krishna of course reciprocally always simply does not accept service but he in turn pleases the devotees or the living beings. So this way Krishna his, he performs daily duties without fail every single day after rising early in the morning three hours before sunrise. So this is to set an example for us that we should do the daily duties as recommended in the scriptures. Now in this Kali Yuga, the scriptures explain for householders particularly, it is very difficult to perform this Panchamaha Yajna, these five kinds of sacrifices to the Devatas, sacrifices to the Rishi, sacrifices to the general living beings etc. So it is recommended in place of this Panchamaha Yajna 
one should perform sankirtan yajna in the bhagavatam it is mentioned krishna varnam pisha krishnam sango pandastra parshadam yajnai sankirtana praye yajantihi sumedasaha one can worship the supreme lord in his incarnation as chaitanya mahaprabhu who is krishna himself in kali yuga simply by performing sankirtan yajna so sankirtan yajna consists of uh, chanting the hare krishna mantra simply by chanting the hare krishna mantra in two ways one is chanting in the form of japa that is one should individually chant and hear the hare krishna mantra personally and then we can perform sankirtan yajna by uh, participating in kirtan kirtan means singing with a melody the hare krishna mantra and in that way also we can perform sankirtan yajna of course sankirtana actually means congregational chanting in a group family members can get together or in a community or in a temple anywhere people can gather together and one person leads the singing of the hare krishna mantra and others follow in uh, in response so this is called sankirtana so this sankirtan yajna is the easiest way of performing our daily duty of sacrifice to vishnu and this doesn't require any expenditure it doesn't require any elaborate arrangements so it is the easiest most practical and certainly the most recommended form of sacrifice for all of us so therefore it is uh, explained by shri la prabhupad that we cannot do the pancha maha yajna therefore in this age kali yuga kala utad hari kirtana bhagavatam also recommends in kali yuga one should perform hari kirtana or sankirtan yajna now i shall uh, answer some questions from yesterday's session uh the first question that is there if the mayavadi say that each soul has come from superior soul and they don't give a give the superior soul a form they say it's formless then what is the form and size of the superior soul that they refer to now actually the superior soul or the supreme soul is krishna krishna has his transcendental form and his form is actually unlimited but still he is present in his form in the spiritual world in uh, different uh, manifestations as krishna as balaram as narayana as vasudeva as sankarshana so many different expansions krishna with his different expansions he is present in the spiritual world as a lord each of the spiritual planets is present as a lord but the mayavadis they ultimately say there is only one soul which is formless and that is the only soul that is in existence and there is nothing other than that one soul supreme soul or supreme absolute truth and that is simply they describe that as brahman uh, impersonal brahman formless brahman and they wrongly consider each living being as identical with that brahman with that formless brahman with that formless absolute truth with this formless supreme soul or supreme uh, uh, lord or whatever so this is their misconception this is their misunderstanding actually <clears throat> actually in the spiritual world the supreme lord is present as a supreme soul and all the living beings are present as individual souls in this world also there are individual souls every living being is individual soul but in this world the, the living beings are entrapped in different bodies that's the difference in this world we are trapped in a material body in the spiritual world those living beings who are liberated souls who are devotees they are having their spiritual form and they are engaged in devotional service to krishna or narayana the supreme lord in the spiritual world next question 
can you please explain the terms plenary and primary expansions of the supreme lord this is explained by shila prabhupada in the bhagavad gita that uh, there are what is the meaning of primary expansion of the supreme lord supreme lord krishna has got two kinds of expansions called primary expansion and secondary expansion the primary expansion supreme lord are the expansions of his own spiritual transcendental form just like krishna expands as balaram narayana vasudeva sankarshana pradyumna aniruddha narasimha varaha vamana so many different forms all these forms are krishna himself the supreme person himself god himself but in different forms he performs different pastimes he expands into those forms for the sake of his devotees who uh, uh, relate with him who connect with him in that particular form because they serve him in that form just like pralad pralad relates with the supreme lord in the form of narasimha hanuman is a devotee who relates with the supreme lord in the form of rama so narasimha rama all these are forms of the supreme lord only but these are different forms in the sense that the supreme lord is not limited by one form he is present simultaneously in millions of forms called incarnations or expansions so these are the primary expansions krishna and rama there is no difference in the power there is no difference in the in the in the uh, potencies uh, so but krishna reciprocates with his devotees in the form of krishna and rama reciprocates with his devotees in the form of rama just like if you study ramayana you can read about rama's devotees so many different varieties of devotees so many different categories of devotees so many different uh, numbers of devotees huh? they have unlimited devotees in each category they have unlimited devotees so in different forms so like that uh, the supreme lord as uh, in different forms primary expansion then the secondary expansion of the supreme lord krishna is called the living being the jiva the jiva soul this individual souls they are also expansions but they are tiny separated expansions they are separate from the lord now the primary expansion of the lord are the lord himself non different from the lord one person the lord supreme lord is one person even though present in so many forms as rama narsimha varaha balaram vasudeva sankarshana all these forms are multiple forms but it is one lord one supreme lord one person there is only one person ekameva advitiya god is one and there is no second god there there is only one god but he is simultaneously present in different forms for different pastimes for different devotees for different uh, uh, for different purposes so uh, the primary expansions are god himself but the secondary expansions are the innumerable living beings unlimited number of living beings countless living beings they are all very tiny separated expansions so they are very 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 tiny and the living beings are having a very very insignificant portion of some of the qualities of the supreme lord and the living beings are also spiritual by nature just like the supreme lord is spiritual by nature the living beings are conscious just like the supreme lord himself is conscious but our consciousness is very very limited just uh, uh, limited consciousness limited qualities limited um, power very very limited power whereas krishna or any of his primary expansions rama narsimha they are unlimited personalities they are unlimitedly powerful 
they are unlimitedly uh, uh, unlimited in every respect their consciousness is spread everywhere uh, so but they are all one person they are not different persons they act as different persons but they are one person god so primary expansion is the lord himself in his different incarnations and the secondary expansions are all the living beings and what is plenary expansion plenary expansion means the primary expansion plenary expansion means the supreme lord when he expands the expanded form has got the same power as the original form just like krishna and rama rama's powers are same as krishna's powers rama's powers are same as krishna's powers uh, so krishna's power does not diminish when he expands in his primary expansions krishna does not diminish in his power or potency so he's got the full powers in all his primary expansions so those primary expansions are also called plenary expansions plenary means with full power whereas the living beings are not plenary expansions they are separated expansions so living beings have very 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 tiny amount of power of krishna very very small quantity of power the next question what is the difference between akarma and nishkama karma yoga akarma akarma means devotional service akarma means performing activities of devotion to krishna akarma means those activities where there is no reaction uh, so only devotional service if we do then there is no reaction whereas nishkama karma yoga is one way of performing karma yoga karma yoga is the beginning in the yoga ladder there are four types of yoga principally described in the bhagavad gita karma yoga jnana yoga ashtanga yoga and bhakti yoga so karma yoga is the yoga of action jnana yoga is the yoga of knowledge ashtanga yoga is the yoga of meditation and bhakti yoga is the yoga of devotion now these four yoga systems described in the bhagavad gita for somebody who cannot directly take up bhakti yoga they can progressively begin with karma yoga and gradually from karma yoga they can go to jnana yoga progress to jnana yoga progress to ashtanga yoga then progress to bhakti yoga so those who cannot directly take up bhakti yoga for them it is described that uh, they have to begin with karma yoga now karma yoga can be of two types sakama karma yoga and nishkama karma yoga sakama karma yoga is they perform karma yoga but they desire something in return they want some benefit that's called sakama karma yoga and nishkama karma yoga is the next advanced stage where one sacrifices or renounces the results of the yoga practice that's called nishkama karma yoga so that way one makes progress so the two are different nishkama karma yoga is the uh, lower level of yoga practice or the beginning of yoga practice whereas akarma is devotional service or bhakti which is the most advanced stage of practicing yoga last question if a soul disconnects with the particular body once departed what is the use of offering pinda or performing shraddha for the departed soul yes there is uh, this recommendation of performing shraddha for a departed soul as a duty of a descendant just like if i perform shraddha for my departed father then it is my duty to do it because i have received so much from him he has actually uh, raised me he has uh, actually given me this body in combination with my mother and then he has given me the he has given me the uh, he has raised me he has uh, maintained me i have received so many things from him so the scriptures say i have got a duty towards my parents so one of the duties is to perform the shraddha 
So how will the shraddha benefit the departed soul, even though disconnect from the body? It is because when I perform shraddha, actually what am I doing? I am offering Vishnu Prasad to the departed soul. Thereby, by offering that Vishnu Prasad to the departed soul in the form of shraddha ceremony or pinda pradana, actually that departed soul will get spiritual benefit. So, having received so much from my father or from my parents, if I perform shraddha, then I am benefiting, I am giving something in return to my father as a gratitude. So, this is called a duty. Now, if somebody becomes a devotee and performs devotional service to Krishna, then it is described in the Bhagavatam, there is no need to separately perform the Shraddha. There is no need to perform separately Shraddha for those who are engaged in performing devotional service to Krishna. Automatically, by performing devotional service to Krishna, one can actually satisfy all the others from whom we have taken benefit. Devatas or forefathers or one's own parents or other living beings, everybody is satisfied simply by performing devotional service to Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss any updates.